My name is Jordan Buckner, for those who don't know, founder of Food Bevy, an online community to help food and beverage companies grow from startup to scale. And today we are talking about building a sustainable CPG brand. Sustainability can mean a lot of things. And so I've invited three really great founders to be panelists for today's session to talk about what sustainability means to them personally for their brand and how they've been able to execute that into the market. Also talk about some of the, the challenges that come with being a sustainable company and the opportunities as well as we are building a better food system. So with that said, I would love for each of our panelists to introduce themselves and how they're incorporating uh, sustainability into their business. So Kate, why don't we start with you? Sure, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Um, my name's Kate. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Sun and Swell. We're building an online plastic-free health food, health food store. Um, we didn't start that way, so I'll tell you a little bit about our sustainability journey. So. Um, we started as a pretty traditional CPG brand. I was focused on bringing healthy food, healthy snacks to the market. Um, shortly into my journey, I realized I was super passionate about um, trying to figure out a way to bring healthy snacks to the market in plastic-free packaging. And so we began our journey of transitioning over to compostable packaging. This was a couple years ago. A lot of bumps along the way. Um, we basically put it out in the market. It failed. Um, and so about a year ago, we um, made a decision to go all in, shift our business model to completely accommodate and support um, compostable plastic-free packaging. So we pivoted from CPG brand to plastic-free online retailer. Um, and now we have um, nearly 100 products. We're trying to add more and more. Um, but our main focus, as you can probably tell a little bit from my story, is, um, is really help shifting the industry away from single-use plastic and doing that through um, by bringing, uh, helping bring to market the compostable packaging that exists in the food um, industry today. Um, and so plastic free is our main focus when it comes to sustainability. We're also focused on um, trying to source directly to farms as possible to eliminate, uh, to bring consumers closer to the food that they're eating. I love that. Thanks so much and have a ton more questions for you, but we'll get into those later. Um, next, I would love to invite Pat up to do a quick intro. Cool. Uh, thanks for having me, Jordan. I'm Pat, the co-founder of 12 Tides. Um, we make tasty and ocean-friendly snacks with kelp from regenerative ocean farms here in the U.S. Um, a little super quick backstory. I founded 12 Tides after I spent a number of years in so sort of the old school seafood industry is like large scale commercial fishing and aquaculture. And saw so, uh, all the bad things going on in the oceans, uh, pollution, coastline destruction, uh, overfishing, and knew there had to be a better way for the food system to intersect uh, with the oceans. So um, still not a super well-known fact, but growing kelp in the ocean is actually an active good for the ocean. And so we wanna make that a much bigger part of the food system. And so then as I think about our sustainability pillars, that is sort of our number one, our prime focus is to make kelp a, a bigger part of the food system and transform our oceanic food system to regenerative. And then beyond that, uh, we are also working on using our community and platform to advocate for ocean restoration projects uh, around the world um, through our partner Sea Trees. And then lastly, Sustainable packaging, obviously single-use petroleum-based packaging doesn't have a very good implication for the ocean. So Kate has actually been one of my mentors on that journey. I love that. And last we have Carolyn. Hey, thanks so much. Um, I'm Caroline. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Renewal Mill. Um, our main focus is upcycled food. So really trying to reduce food waste at the manufacturing level. Um, we got started because my co-founder founded Boston's first organic juice company and was kind of appalled at the amount of um, juice pulp coming out of that process. And then when we met the owner of the third largest tofu company in the country, we quickly learned that there was a pulp waste problem at his scale as well. So we um, primarily upcycle the byproducts of plant-based milk right now, soy milk and oat milk, and turn them into high fiber gluten-free flours. Um, we sell those flowers to other companies to use in their products like Pulp Pantry and Tia Lupita. 
And then we also use some of them in our own plant-based baking mixes and ready to eat cookies. So um, we also helped found the Upcycled Food Association at the end of 2019, because we saw the need to really educate consumers around what we were doing with food waste reduction and upcycled food. And then just this past April, um, we helped release the first ever certified upcycled seal. So now starting the summer, you'll start to see on packages, um, a little stamp that says the product is certified upcycled the way that it would be certified organic or certified non-GMO. And we are hoping that this helps consumers understand that when they purchase upcycled food, they're helping reduce food waste, which is actually the number one thing we can do to fight climate change right now. Um, so happy to answer any questions in that regard. Um, and then obviously trying to, trying to constantly improve our packaging and carbon offset all of our production as well. Excellent. So, so many great things here. Um, what I would love to do, just so everyone know, we're going to get into some questions that I have for our panelists, but then if you have any questions that come up throughout the conversation, I'd love for you to just go ahead and add those right into the chat. And then what I will do is ask our panelists um, for those questions directly so that you can get those answered throughout the presentation so we don't have to wait all the way to the end. Um, if we do have any time at the end for open Q&A, uh, we'll bring people up to ask your questions directly to our panelists as well. So Kate, I kind of want to talk with you and start about, um, go deeper into your transition because I remember when you got started with your snacks and seeing those and then kind of seeing your transition over to um, this new world. But you know, talk about that transition and then you know why compostable packaging and then what the journey was like to actually create a brand using compostable packaging. Yeah, so, um... I'll start with kind of, I'll start with the second question of like why we chose to focus on compostable packaging. So for us, we think about like, there's a lot of different ways to help eliminate single use plastic from this industry. There's um, some like good, like, you know, recycling programs, loop type of um, programs where there's reusable containers. For us, we're focusing on compostable because um, it's just a different way to address the market. We know that right now, the majority of consumers are buying their groceries in plastic bags. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible for them um, to just make that simple trade-off. So some consumers will go out of their way and change their habits. Others, we just want to make them easy. Instead of buying in plastic, you're going to buy in compostable. So that's why our focus is on compostable. And then there's other people doing amazing things focusing on like reusable. Um, we love compostable because if it's composted, it turns back in, if it's properly composted, it'll turn back into soil and it kind of creates that cr closed loop system. So obviously making sure it gets composted is another piece of the, um, the, the thing that we have to think about. Um, in terms of um, just the journey of where, how we went from like CPG brand to transitioning to a retailer around it, basically what happened in 2019 we tried to transition. We, we were selling these grab and go snacks and plastic packaging. Um, we got our first order in and of compostable packaging and we just kind of rushed into it. And I was like, at, at this time we were selling primarily through wholesale channels. So 90% wholesale, 10% on our website, on our website, we transitioned everything over to compostable packaging. And within three months, it was uh, pretty scary. We were seeing uh, velocities decline. We were losing shelf space. Um, we were having like, we were having, we were losing customers. Like basically what was happening was when the packaging was finally getting to the shelf and sitting on the shelf, it started to not look as good. Um, it was the compostable packaging just by nature, it's more delicate. It doesn't look as much of like, like a work of art, like plastic packaging can. Um, it starts, so little things, it'll get wrinkly, the edges will start to curl. Um, the food inside was fine, it wasn't staling, but when you're a consumer and you're walking through the grocery store shelves and you have never seen compostable packaging in your life because nobody's selling in it right now, um, and you see this kind of beat up looking bag next to a plastic bag, like you're gonna think that's like old and not good. You're not gonna think, oh, that's eco-friendly packaging. And I think there's a day you know, five, 10 years from now, that that's the norm. But right now, the norm is beautiful plastic packaging on a shelf. And um, we kind of learned that the hard way and that like, it wasn't as easy as us just switching our packaging over, especially I think, when we launched our brand, our packaging, I would say was like a work of art, it was very beautiful, we got a lot of recognition for like our branding. And so it was just it was just this 
weird. Um, personally, as a founder, I had a lot of tension. Like I had a lot of um, trouble in my head, like deciding, like, do I want to um, go, like, should I go back to plastic and like keep our bit current business model? Because I don't think we can do it in compostable or do we go all in and compostable and figure out a way to make it work? Um, we obviously chose the latter, but for us, we thought we felt like to make the biggest impact in the industry, if our industry is to really help move, or if our mission is really to help move the industry away from single use plastic, to make the biggest industry, we don't believe that the traditional food industry, grocery industry as it's set up today um, is, is really ready for the technology where it is today at a large scale. I think that there's ways to work directly with retailers, but when we were trying to think of the huge impact we wanted to make, we felt like the best way to do it was to go direct to consumer. Um, and we also heard our consumers saying, we don't just want your snacks. We want everything. We want to have an entire plastic free pantry. We don't just want one little plastic free thing. And so, um, you know, we kind of listened to what our consumers were asking for listening, listen, or to what, like, we felt like the current industry, you know, was supporting and we're like, okay, let's, um, let's just lean all in and plastic free and try to give consumers, our customers, the option to fill their entire pantries with plastic free items, um, which was kind of a catalyst behind um, that whole that whole shift. I, I really appreciate you sharing that because I think that's the tension that a lot of founders face because there are some potential downsides in going with compostable reusable packaging and those need to be very well considered and it can drastically change your business as you've you've explained, but I think there's a lot of positives to, to come from that. And I think, you know, I know your, your pivot has paid off because, you know, I want to say a huge congrats because you just raised um, almost $670,000 for your uh, WeFunder equity crowd raising campaign. Yeah. So huge congratulations Thank for you. that. That is amazing. Yeah, um, so, excited. so proud of what you've been able to do there. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I always tell, I think um, for any brands that are on this, and um, I know uh, Pat, I'm sure has perspective on this as well. Like I always, I, I feel like I, I get a lot of questions about brands, like, you know, how, like about switching to compostable. And I always say like, you just have to make sure you're truly committed to it. Like it, it's not like if you're, if, you, if it's, if it's checking the box on sustainability, there are so many other boxes you can check, like pick a different box if you, but you have to really truly be committed to working with compostable and, and um, that has to be really important for you. And for some people, um, I know it is, and that's amazing. And you should do everything you can to, you know, um, keep fighting the battle, but, um, but it is, it's a, being like a pioneer using compostable packaging for the first time in the market. It's not easy. And you just have to like, make sure you're, uh, before you put all the effort behind it, like, that's something you're that's really important yeah I, I love that because if it's not core to what you do those costs and changes definitely fall by the wayside you know that actually goes to a question that peter has he asks, what are the general cost differences between compostable packaging and plastic packaging yeah so um i have i can give you the example of the snack packs because we were sourcing both um so with the snack packs we were sourcing which were like when uh, were small stand-up pouches um, we were paying about, um, and again, we're small, we're early stage startups. So I'm sure this changes when you get giant, but at the time we were paying about, uh, tw I think, um, 12 to 15 cents for a plastic pack and about 22 cents for, um, a large or for a compostable pack. So it is, um, you know, it is, it is definitely more expensive, not, um, like 30% more expensive, but, um, but I, I, it's hard because I don't think um, consumers are ready yet to pay a premium for just for the packaging. I don't think like the way that they do like for organic. Um, but it's not, to me, it wasn't dramatic enough to be able to build it into your market, especially if you're building a brand. I think trend, if you already have a really large wholesale presence, uh, distributor presence, making that switch will have an impact. Um, but if you're, if you're starting early and you can figure out a way to build it in, it's definitely doable. It doesn't like price you out of the market. Awesome. I love that. Pat, I want to move over to you and talk about, you know, what, what you're doing with sustainability for your brand um, and how you've been able to make a, an impact with what you're doing so far. And I think with, you know, the ingredient side of it and as well as like the packaging and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. I can sort of start on the, the ingredient side of it. Um, you know, as I sort of did my adventures around, around the seafood world, I, I started to 
I saw a lot of bad stuff. And then I saw a lot of, or I met a few people who were growing kelp in the sort of regenerative ocean farming model. And um, that was a very new thing in the US. It's like, they're, I don't know, maybe the oldest farms are like 10 years old. Um, and then a lot of farms are starting up every year. And so the you know, growing kelp is very new in the United States, but also consuming kelp is, is very new in, in the United States. And so uh, I think a big part of um, you know, us as a brand right now is, is educating you know, consumers about um, the impacts of, of you know, why they should choose kelp and, and snack on kelp instead of you know, corn, wheat, rice, potato. Um, and so that, in terms of like our number one goal as a brand, that you know, increasing of regeneratively farmed kelp as, as a component of the food system and um, supporting our farmers along the way, we source directly from the farmers. So we have very tight relationships with them. That is, um, that's really number one. And, and we want to you know, engage people on that, that journey. Um, as far as sustainable packaging, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, we wanted to be an ocean positive brand from, from the first day. And um, <laughs> there's a, but through some of my travels, I spent some time on shrimp farms over in Indonesia and just uh, saw, you know, seas of plastic, um, you know, in the mangroves and, and things like that. And having single use plastic packaging just didn't feel very good and, and felt pretty you know, directly contradictory to, to what we were trying to do. So, um, you know, we've worked on that uh, since the very beginning, and, and thanks to Kate for, for all of her help. You know, fortunately, we did sort of price it in from the very beginning, so we um, you know, didn't have to worry about making sort of that transition. But it is hard, and it's, it, I think it has supply chain implications. You know, getting our compostable packaging is so much more of a you know, nightmare than like calling up your local like, plastic pouch converter and just like ordering a batch. Um, we have really high minimums. Um, and we have to ship it from overseas and that has been a cluster during COVID. And so uh, there's, it, it is very, you know, beyond just like the cost thing, I think it's a really hard thing to implement. So I think Kate's right that you really have to be dedicated to the journey. Um, and it's not as easy, unfortunately, as like going on compostablepackaging.com and like clicking buy and it's problem solved. <laughs> Pat, I know your, your packaging is pretty beautiful. Um, are you able to, so how were you able to like get, you know, pretty good, like a really good like design kind of on compostable packaging? Are there issues with like the inks that are used on there and things like that? How does that play into it? Yeah, it's, <laughs> there are some like design limitations as well in terms of like what your coverage can be um, uh, in terms of inks. So we, uh, we work with a company called Foodamora that uh, does a lot of the films. Um, they're a Japanese company that's kind of like the leader in that space. And we, we found sort of a combination. I don't know that it just like looked pretty good. And we found a printer who was able to give us like this nice matte, um, you know, print on it. And, uh, you know, in a way that, you know, maintained its certified uh, industrial compostability. So we're, we've been pretty happy with it, but honestly, it's not perfect. We have a pretty short shelf life for a snack. And, um, you know, we have been able to like sort of work with Foodamura. They're they're a pretty good group to like find new materials, um, and I think we're going to be able to improve it in in the future. But like I said, I mean, this has been like a year. Like we've got this one right now. It's like mediocre at best, and uh, you know, we're continuing to put in product development effort to like find the next better like iteration. So it's definitely a journey. I love that. And I, I posted some, um, a link to, to their site for anyone who's interested. You know, I know that's always one of the big questions, like who can I go to for or, or, uh, compostable or post-consumer recyclable packaging? Um, do you or, or any of the others have like companies that you would recommend that are good to work with or to look at exploring with? I, I'd say be wary of some groups out there advertising compostable packaging because it's not, you sort of have to do your own homework. It's not always like actually certified compostable. Um, you know, they may just be like reselling it from, from somewhere else. Uh, so, you know, we kind of like went all the way back to the source, like Foodamore is like the actual like manufacturer of the films. And then, um, you know, sort of started 
from there. And so I, I think, yeah, you do have to, so some of the suppliers I talked to like don't really know what they're talking about in terms of compostable packaging and certifications and stuff. So you have to dig in. Next. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree with that. I think people at, like to, um, I think it's becoming common now for people to use the term a lot. Uh, the two, a couple other places I would recommend is um, TIPA, T-I-P-A. Um, they're an Israeli-based company. Um, they are, um, they're, they don't have a large presence in the U.S. right now, but they're starting to make their way. They have a big presence in Europe. Um, and then the other company um, is a. Uh, Elk Packaging. They're based in LA. They're not actually mm -hmm. making the film themselves, but um, Jean, who leads the program there, is very, um, very uh, knowledgeable, and she's um, involved in like all the conversations around it. Um, but again, high, you have to be prepared for high minimums. It's not, you know, um, a five thousand dollar or five thousand unit uh, entry level run. It's it is. They do get a little higher than that. Okay, was that um, elk like E L K? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. But yeah, it's a lot of homework. And I, th I think that's like, a, and, and Pat might be able to relate with this. I think it's not as simple as I think a lot of times I'll get the, the question of like, who do you go to? It's like, I don't have a, a, it's, this is like years of learning and talking to supplier. It's not like a one answer for yeah. everybody. It's very different. And so, um, but you can, you know, there's, those are some good places to start to look into for sure. Perfect. Appreciate you sharing those. And um, I'll also, so we've been post, I've been posting links to those in the chat. Um, so you can take a look at those companies and then we'll also circle up and get some other recommendations for after this as well to email out to everyone. Um, and then Caroline, I'd love for you just to jump into your story on of using upcycled ingredients and, you know, the benefit of that, but then also the challenges, I'm sure, in terms of uniformity and things like that. Yeah, for sure. I guess I'll also just uh, comment briefly on packaging. Um, to Pat's point of shelf life, uh, the minimum shelf life of all of our flowers and baking mixes is a year. And so that's been a huge point in us not being able to switch all of our packaging to um, compostable. So a huge pain point for us. Um, as an interim solution, we've kind of certified ourselves as plastic negative. So trying to help fund projects that remove plastic from the environment, but hoping that the technology gets there so that we're able to have fully compostable pouches for our retail products um, in the near future. As far as upcycled ingredients go, um, yeah, it's there's a lot of, you know, excitement around upcycled food right now as far as um, just what you're able to, to do as far as turning um, different, you know, parts of the food supply chain and making them more circular. So there's on farm food waste that you're able to upcycle that ugly produce. Um, like I said, we're working more at the manufacturing level where these byproducts have traditionally been labeled as waste, but in fact are really full of nutrition. And we're kind of saving that fiber and protein that's processed out of a lot of our food and keeping it in the supply chain. Um, so yeah, I think there's just a lot of functional benefits. Um, our first two ingredients are very neutral in flavor and color. So they're easy to integrate into a lot of traditional um, flour-based products, but then also add all of these nutritional benefits. Um, but yeah, happy to kind of chat more about uh, also the marketing around it, I think is really interesting. Um, we, when we started, we're kind of you know, people were wary of like, oh, are you trying to feed me waste? And what does that mean? And I was even introduced as like the trash cookie lady at like some pitch things. And you're like, no, no, that's definitely not what we're trying to do. Um, and I think over the last 18 months, it's been really exciting to see kind of just this groundswell of support for the upcycled food movement spearheaded by like Whole Foods putting upcycled food as a top 10 trend for 2021. Um, and I think people have really kind of understood what that means from a sustainability angle. Um, and also Kroger recently put some funding behind upcycled food. So some really big retailers that are kind of championing the, the messaging and the, and the movement. I love that. And, you know, that really leads into the next question of does sustainability sell, right? Like, is that a front of pack or front of company thing that you put out there and there's an audience? And if so, how big is it? And if not, what have been the challenges? Sorry, I ripped my headphones out. Could you just repeat the beginning? Yeah, of that totally. Um, do, at least what you just said leads to the question of does sustainability sell? Mm. And if so, what are the, you know, who, what's the audience for it? And how big is that audience? And if not, how do you 
slide in sustainability without that being core to your your selling message or is is it yeah i mean we've done research um on our own as well as there's a lot of you know uh, research from nielsen and stuff showing that people are prioritizing sustainability and when they're looking for products even more than organic in some cases which is um, really exciting especially gen z consumers and millennial consumers who kind of are demanding that the companies they purchase from are you know practicing sustainable uh, or doing sustainable uh, processing but I think you know ultimately the product still has to taste really good like that is first and foremost um, why consumers buy food and then um, they're willing to pay more to a point so I think you know you have to be within range um, and and then from on, on the b2b side for us for ingredients they're also looking for functionality so um, we're able to like use our upcycled flowers to unseat things like um, coconut or cassava flour, um, and that gives them access to additional marketing benefits. But if it doesn't taste good or it doesn't perform well in their formulation, um, it's not going to be enough just because it's a sustainable product. But I do think on the retail shelf, it is a unique differentiator and that people do care, which is why we've put so much effort into this um, upcycled certification and really having that trust from the consumer so that there's no greenwashing when it comes to sustainability, that they can like really trust um, what you're doing and what you're saying you're doing is true and actually having an impact. And we switched all of our packaging just at the beginning of this year to be more upcycled forward. So now it says like fight climate change right on the front. It explains what upcycled food is. Um, and before we had kind of relegated that story to back of pack, but we've kind of moved it into the into the um, forefront so that it's it's really clear for consumers. That's really great to know. And, and I wonder if you know sustainability sells more in some categories over others. I'm guessing it depends on like the ingredients as well. And then like Pat, what's been your experience of of like, you know, you don't have necessarily like sustainable kelp kind of right on the front, like you mentioned that's kelp, but you're in the kind of salty snack set, right? What's it like being there? Yeah, I, I totally agree with Caroline. I, I think number one is that it has to like taste good. Like I think sustainability like might win you like one purchase, but nobody's gonna buy it twice if it doesn't taste good. So I, I think um, you know, in terms of I think like the hierarchy for our customers is like taste number one. And, and but I do think sustainability is number two. Um, I, I think our customers in a large part are people who are engaged in the food system and um, are aware of the impact of um, our food on, on the planet and uh, you know want alternatives as we look at ourselves in the salty snacks at alternatives to you know corn, wheat, um, you know, rice, potato, and um, you know, that's uh, that's kind of the value proposition we bring with the the um, you know the puff kelp chips. As far as our design, uh, we kept it pretty simple, um, you know, at at the outset. But um, uh, a lot of our brand messaging on on sort of other platforms and email marketing and, and Instagram and things like that is it's very centered around sustainability, and that's um, I don't know, messaging item number one. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because with my brand T-Squares, very core to our story was their social mission of hiring young adults from underserved communities um, in Chicago and really talking about the social um, impact that we were giving back to. But it also wasn't like a Tom's one for one story where it was like very easy to describe on PAC, like we were creating jobs directly and helping people through employment but there was no like it wasn't as as easily marketable um, to put out there and we found the same thing where you know with almost every single survey that you do of consumers and what they're looking for like taste is number one it's food it's something you put in your mouth it touches your tongue first which is the center to all of your taste buds right and so that's going to be the number one thing always uh for brands like not to forget working within food um but then some of those other elements from sustainability or, uh, you know, social impact are things that can be talked about, but it's usually going to help with repeat purchase, right? Some people will buy it because of that, but that really helps with the repeat purchase and telling that story of something that already works, right? So if someone loves your product, they feel even better being able to, to eat that. Um, here's a question and, and that kind of comes up a lot especially during COVID, there's a big push toward 
like individual packed snacks and items and things like that. But obviously that creates more packaging waste overall, even if it is compostable. Um, so how do you think about or, or manage that within your own brand and how you're going about your business? We can start with Pat and then kind of go towards Kate or others. Yeah, that's an interesting one. We have not done a single serve pack yet. Um, I do, I, I think I've gotten a few of those like snack boxes and I think the single serves tend to be you know most prominent there. And um, yeah, the, the amount of plastic packaging that's like included in those, those boxes is uh, makes me a little uneasy. Um, I, I think it is a, a challenge because I think it's something we will do eventually, you know, hopefully we can overcome some of the challenges associated with um, you know, compostable packaging and you know, there's a whole back end mess of compostable packaging that we haven't you know, touched on yet but uh, um, you know, it, it does open up some new channels to like have that single serve offering and I think that's something that we'll we'll have to do eventually but we do want to be you know sort of thoughtful as we uh, enter that space. Kay there, Carolyn, any thoughts? Yeah, I would say, um, I mean, our, our whole business before COVID was single serve. We were doing like the single serve snack packs. Um, that's how we like got our off the ground in the first place because um, we were trying to be there, um, convenient, healthy snack for people. And uh, our post pivot, we're basically all pantry size um, because now we're focused on people's pantries versus people um, consumers on the go. But um, we are hearing a lot like, you know, our, we had a really big presence in corporate offices before COVID that obviously all went away um, with our snack packs. We're hearing it starting to, you know, now our offices are getting back um, and a lot of like that whole, like there's not going to be any more bulk in offices, like it's going to be single serve. And um, it's a really interesting area to us. We think about it like all, like we keep thinking about it, like, um, can we have this? Yeah. Like, can we have like a all of our things that are in pantry, can we have them in snacks and have a program for offices and work with these big corporate offices and help make sure they're packaged, like if we do it in compostable and then make sure that those, all those bags are going in a bin and getting composted. Um, it's just that it's, it's definitely something that somebody's going to do really well. And we think about it, but we're also, um, we try to stay focused on, you know, it, it's, it's, it's the, the constant uh, challenge of like wanting to do everything and try all these new things. But, uh, but definitely like, I think there's room for, um, or somebody to come in with a really innovative model for corporate offices once they're back in session um, with either compostable or reusable. Um, but the end of, to, it, at that scale, um, end of life needs to be taken. Like it, it, somebody has to be thinking through end of life as well. Yeah, and Kate, what are you doing in terms of encouraging customers to actually compost your packaging? Yeah, so we um, we launched a send back program um, to, I, it's still kind of in the beta version. Um, we launched it last fall, um, but we're, we're still figuring out. But basically what we, what we realized was um, when we transitioned to compostable, we wanted to be able to give cu customers answers on where they could compost them. So your first instinct is, okay, well, if they live near a compost facility, they can take it. But as you dig deeper into the industry, you learn that most industrial compost facilities don't take anything other than food scraps, or even if, uh, because their compost um, facilities aren't set up on a time frame that accommodates those things. So if you think about compostable bowls, compostable knives, you go to restaurants, you're throwing them in the compost bin. It's... Uh, I don't want to say unlikely, but there's a high chance that those aren't actually, they're getting removed and put in landfill because compost facilities are not always composting those either. They're, they're not set up for it, or they don't know there's no, you know, they don't have a, that specific compost facility doesn't have a uniform um, or there's, they're maybe looking for a certain seal and it's not a different seal that's on, you know, the compostable fork that they see. So this applies to everything compostable, not just our packaging, but an entire world of compostables um, stuff outside of like food scraps and whatnot. So um, our concern, we learned this and we're like, okay, it's no longer about like telling people to like send it to their industrial compost facility. Um, so for us, we like we launched a send back program that allows people to send their bags back to us and then we can compost them for them. Um, 
And we have customers pay for it right now. We'd love to make it free. Um, I think eventually we will be able to like subsidize it and have that program be free. But for now, they opt into it. We send them a bag. They fill it with like up to 40 of our bags and they send it back to us. And then we work with a local partner to compost it. Um, and a lot of customers take advantage of that. But this is like, I think this is like a huge, huge thing, especially when we're talking about compostal packaging. I have a big fear um, that it's going to like end up like the next recycling. Like we need, we need to get ahead of it early. And the good thing is, I think um, this is actually like one of the very first things me and Pat talked about when we connected um, last summer. Like the good thing is the brands who are really focused on compostable are thinking through that problem. I don't think we're, I don't think we're going to end up with a recycling situation because I think people are trying to get ahead of it, but it's like, who does it fall, the responsibility fall onto? Does it respond, fall onto the manufacturer? Does it fall onto cities? Like, cause the, the reality of the infrastructure getting there um, in the next five years is very unlikely. Like that's, that's, that's a long ways away. So it's, um, it's a huge thing that's going on behind the scenes. I don't think consumers much are, are thinking about it, but I know brands, manufacturers, um, the industries uh, thinking about it. No, I think that's huge. And you know, I know that happens with recycling a lot where a lot of things people think are recyclable or actually mm -hmm. not recyclable at the facilities that they're ending up at and they end up in the waste stream as well. Like they don't just yeah. divert them to, I, I would assume most of them don't divert them to another facility that could do it. They just like don't want to deal with it yeah. because it's a business also. So that's kind of wild. Um, all right, so there's lots of great questions popping up in the chat. So I want to kind of run through a couple of these um, and get your, your opinion on. So a question from earlier, have any of you come across a compostable packaging that works with frozen? Um, Alejandro said this, he tried hard and cellulose just dissolves, I guess. Um, so have any of you seen or talked with a vendor who can do that? Uh, I can, uh... I've sort of helped uh, a bunch of other brands with various products from like um, like pickles to other snacks and, and stuff like that. It just, it varies widely. And I think that's sort of like part of the journey is, is you probably won't know um, until you, you try it and uh, try to test it, shelf life test it. And um, it'll take, you know, months, um, you know, if, if not more than that to, to like really figure it out. But uh, I don't know if, you know, anybody really has like a definitive answer there until um, you just get your hands on some material and start testing it. Yeah, unfortunately, all of my experience is with dry dry goods. So I, I've been asked that a lot and I don't, other than um, referring you to check with some of those resources we listed earlier, um, I don't have, a, I don't have a, a lot of help to give there. Awesome. Um, and then another question from David, have you looked into using post-consumer recycled plastic packaging? Um, we have that for, for us, like we chose the compostable angle. I think post-consumer recycles an awesome, I, I think that's a great alternative. And if I think if we weren't going compostable, we probably would have gotten deeper there. We just, um, the battle we chose is compostable and, um, we do, but that's why we're so passionate about it being like, uh, the end of life problem too, because I think if right. we can get the end of life right, which takes a lot of work, that's like a fully circular system. And you're never like, if we can, the more and more we can move industry away from plastic, um, you know, but I think post-consumer recycle is an awesome option for people who are, um, for people who choose to go that way. Perfect. Um, and then where do you see compostable packaging kind of going in the larger industry do you think that like the larger companies and players are going to start integrating those into their packaging or is it going to be a while until that happens is that I'll, anyone I'll, I'll take a quick stab just because i was just i sat with somebody on a panel about this recently um they're thinking about it for sure i think i saw that skittle they're rolling out some skittles and compostable packaging um but like the challenges that we've started to talk about, Caroline mentioned the, the 12 month shelf life like that, or like, you know, if you have to have an over a year shelf life, it's kind of hard, it's hard to use. Like the entire, I don't think the any, if, if you have a large existing infrastructure for a, like for distributing food, like, and it's like, it's, it's just the whole industry has to change to allow like everybody else to change for it to like, it, you can't just like flip that switch. It's not just a cost thing. It's a shelf life thing. It's a, um, and then 
and then the like I I was on a panel with um somebody from Mars and he was talking about like the whole thing we're talking about from end of life. Imagine that. Imagine for us like we're small. Like we can say, hey, customer center bags back to us. Like we'll compost them for you. Like imagine if like all of a sudden like Mars switched everything over to compostable packaging overnight. If that was even possible, like what would happen with all those bags? So it's like though all the little things that we're talking about. Um, as like emerging brands right here on the call, like that times so much more. So they're all thinking about it. Um, and I don't know what it will look like in 10 years, but definitely we'll see uh, them making steps in the right direction. I love that. Carolyn, question for you, actually. Um, Kara is asking, can you talk about plastic negative and what that means and what you do towards that? Yeah. So we work with a, a company called Repurpose Global that's um, removing as like a, twice as much plastic from the environment as we use. Um, so it's a, it's a program where they, you can kind of select which project you wanna work on. And sometimes they're removing ocean plastic or they're working in communities in um, different countries to remove plastic from the environment um, and hopefully you know, recycle that. Um, but yeah, it definitely is a, a cool interim solution, but we know that it's very much just an interim solution. And then for that, do you actually pay them to kind of support those projects? How does that work? Yeah, so it's it's a certification. So we're we're paying them um, for to be certified, um, very similar to a carbon offset program. Awesome. And then at least I, I had a question. Oh, go ahead, Kate. I was just going to add. I think that um, I think that like Caroline, I think I think I. It, it, I think we both know, like we all as brands have to pick our battles and like, like I wish that everything we were selling was upcycled, but it's not, you know? So it's like, I think that's what we see brands doing a lot, which like everyone on the call is done and which we see a lot in the industry is like, you kind of choose what you want to be known for. And then you figure out ways to do the best you can with everything else. And if we all try to be perfect, um, we would not have brand, like it just wouldn't work. And so it's like, let's fight our battles and choose those battles we want to fight and then just do the best you can with, with everything else. And I think that's where things like um, this, you know, the plastic negative is like a great solution for people who pl just like plastic packaging is what they have to use right now. And that's fine. That's, that's where 99% of the industry is, you know? Yeah. I think it's a great point. You got to focus <laughs> yeah, and okay. try to do one thing really well. Yeah. yeah. No, I love that. And I see uh, KB posted another great option for offsetting carbon and plastic footprint is greenprint.eco. So definitely check those out. And then Eliza was asking, um, how are you, how are consumers kind of finding your products that are compostable or upcycled online? Are you finding that um, consumers are actually searching for that? Have you looked at like keyword research to see if that's something people are actually um, typing in? Um, we have not done a ton of keyword research in that regard, but we are really like fond of utilizing third party platforms. So we're on like a bunch of um, different sites like Thrive Market and Perfect Foods, um, Good Eggs, and those platforms are actually adding filters for upcycled or sustainable. So you can search for products that fall into those categories. Um, also like fair.com. So it's, it's super exciting to, to see them adding those kind of granular filters so that customers can find not only, you know, vegan products, but also products that are in sustainable packaging or in um, helping fight food waste. So that's been a, a key way that we've been doing that. And then obviously we focus a lot on kind of like PR and social media and um, trying to just educate consumers about upcycled food in general. Yeah, um, I would, I would add um, as, as a, as uh, now that we're like 90% DTC um, and that's like been all we've been thinking about for the past year, I can tell you customers are definitely not searching for uh, <laughs> groceries and compostable packaging. Um, and so we have to get creative. It, it makes like, um, it just, it just, it's how it just, we think about like the best marketing channels for us right now. Um, like, I feel like Facebook is a necessary evil, but with Facebook, we can put a picture and say what it is. And they're like, oh, I didn't know that existed. And they can like, you know, then dive in um, versus on Google. It's like, you kind of have to like for search, you kind of have to think of other ways to bring them in um, and even, or even like think of like things they might be searching for that. Like if they saw you, that would be interesting, but that's never the, you get the best, um, the best results with paid search when you're advertising on something that somebody's going and intending to buy. 
So um, it is, that is a, that's a tricky channel for us. We're like really in the middle of trying to figure that all out. And then like Caroline said, we try to use other channels um, as like where we can actually say what we are as uh, the way to drive awareness, but it, it makes marketing um, tricky for, for this kind of stuff. And just a quick programming note, Pat actually had to jump off a little early, he has a television appearance that he's doing for 12 Tide. So wishing him the best of luck. Um, if anyone has any follow up questions directly for Pat, I'm happy to share his email and just reach out to me. Or he actually did it in the chat. So you can reach out to him um, directly there. Um, Kate, you kind of brought up something interesting being e commerce business. Um, it necessitates a lot of shipping packaging. <laughs> Right. And Carol, I know you're doing this too. So what's been your approach to e-commerce packaging in terms of what's available, what's not available and how you're able to reduce waste as much as you can? Um, I can just, I know Kate probably has more experience here, but um, we, for our D2C, we're trying to, um, you know, one of the things that does get recycled is cardboard <laughs> rather than plastics. So we're using um, cardboard packaging from Giver Packaging, and I re have really enjoyed working with them. They do a lot of carbon offsetting too and um, help with tree planting and things like that. Um, we're using paper tape for our packages so that <laughs> there's no plastic waste in that regard. Um, and then also compostable um, envelopes for any boxes, like we can put the, the boxes inside of those um, compostable envelope shippers. Um, but yeah, I think food miles is always gonna be a big concern with direct to consumer, right? Like we're shipping product nationally um, and there's a lot of carbon emissions that go with that. So that's kind of um, why we've focused and doubled down on um, carbon offsets for that part of the business. Um, but yeah, you know, we're, we're trying to reduce our supplier miles as much as we can too. So whenever we're purchasing um, ingredients for added like value added products, we're trying to, to source as locally as possible to reduce the, the carbon emissions on that end, even though we are um, shipping nationwide. Yeah, I, I echo a lot of the same things. Um, we, in terms of like packaging itself, we use plain cardboard boxes with compostable. The, the one thing that gets you with the boxes is when you use really, really heavily inked non-soy based ink, because that makes a cardboard box. Um, interestingly, it, it, it's compostable as long as it's like just cardboard, doesn't have a lot of heavy inks on it. Um, but so we use plain cardboard boxes, we use compostable tape, no issue. Um, it's N-O-I-S-S-U-E, no issue. is a great place for like branded compostable tape or branded compostable tissue paper. We just use plain packing paper. Um, our like our marketing cards are on seed paper that you can plant. So we just really, for us, it's we. There's a way. Um, I think the natural like tendency is to think, oh, you can't really like brand your shipping experience if everything's eco friendly. Um, so that's like for us, we're like you can't. You just make it like an eco friendly branding, and our customers love it. I mean, that's like we get comments on it all the time. We put dried flowers in it as a way to like that surprise and delight, but that's like a way that's, um, you know, not wasteful. Um, and then, um, and then also we'd offset the car, the shipping. Um, but it also is a big thing for us. Like we, we are not at the scale to do this right now, but we're based in California. So like, as we grow, do we do our own distribution? Like, do we have distribution in other parts of the country? So we're not shipping things like nationally, um, right now, it wouldn't make sense for us to do that at our scale, but that's, um, definitely a, in the thought process down the road. Yeah, I think that's great because right, like at, at some degree you have to still get the product to a customer and especially in our day and age, it's not um, as realistic to have a, a growing business and stay like super local where you're reducing that carbon footprint completely. You know, I think there are opportunities in the world to kind of do that, but it's gonna be a much different environment and we can't, you know, we have to also work with what we have today while planning for the future at the same time. And one more thing I forgot to mention, I just dropped into the chat was, is a cool platform called EcoCart. Um, so if you are running a direct to consumer business, you can set up that it's like a Shopify integration and people can offset their shipping cost. Or like if you, we chose to just offset that automatically for our customers. Um, but it's a, it's a really cool program. I love that. That's really cool. I'll definitely look into that as well. Um, any other questions that have come up? So I really love this. It's been like super practical um, for everyone listening in. So hopefully you can get able to get to all your 
your questions here. Um, anything else that comes up, let me know. Let's see. Karen just shared another company, Eco and Close. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. So one thing that I'm going to do after this as well is put together a um, an article kind of listing out all the companies so we can have a go-to place because, you know, since you've been doing this for a while now, I'm sure people reach out with questions, but it's hard still for people to understand like who all the, the options are out there and, and what's available. Um, so Carolyn, where do you see Renewal Mill kind of going next? What are the next big challenges that you're going to be trying to overcome? Yeah, um, I'm also just going to, I think I missed Greg's question in the chat about um, marketing products with less than 100% upcycled material, um, which is also kind of where we're going next, so we can tie them together. Um, yeah, I think coming up with an upcycled certification was a really challenging uh, thing to do because even if you're producing something that is reducing a ton of food waste, for example, like a sweetener, that will never likely be a huge percentage of a final product that you might be selling on shelf. So, so unless you're selling the pure sweetener, if you're selling a baking mix, you're selling a cookie, um, that might not be, you know, more than say five or 6% or of the final product. So through the certification, we kind of created these two pathways. So either your product contains more than 10% upcycled material or the sale of that product is diverting a certain amount of food waste over a dedicated period of time. Um, it's definitely like in its MVP form. So we'll kind of see how it shakes out. But like I said, the goal is really to avoid greenwashing. So we want consumers to say like, this, this contains you know, a certain amount of upcycled material that is actually making a significant impact and that the, the third party audit for the certification is really tracking that that impact is tangible. Um, so our pure flowers are 100% upcycled, but our baking mixes are not because um, there's just like only so much you can do with these flowers that are <laughs> full of fiber and protein. But if you were to use them as the only uh, flour in the product, it would never affect the taste, but the mouthfeel might be different than a consumer is, is looking for. So we do blend them with other traditional ingredients and we're trying to source those sustainably as well. Um, and our hope is that one day there will be upcycled food for every kind of ingredient that we're looking for, but it's not, it's not there quite yet. Um, so what's next for us is we are trying to add new upcycled ingredients to our portfolio. So we have currently the okara coming from soy, the oat, coming from oat milk um, and looking to, to bring on some additional ingredients this year. And then also building out our um, branded product line. So we've kind of started in the baking mix aisle, found some really um, great customer fit there. And so we're kind of expanding our offerings in that regard. Awesome, how about for you, Kate? Yeah, um, just like as a company, um, like I think us on a smaller scale, we're focused on, um, we just made our pivot last year. I, I think I mentioned we have almost 100 products on our website now, but um, they're all under our brand. Um, but our vision is to be more like um, like a, a new age Trader Joe's kind of. We want 100, we don't want an endless aisle, but we do want people to find anything that they want to find, put stock their pantry with. We want, if, as long as it's healthy food, we want to be able to offer it to them. Um, so we have a lot of a lot of room to grow in terms of adding products. That's kind of our, our focus right now. Um, but like our vision for the overall industry is helping the industry transition away from plastic. And I don't I know that right now with the compostable packaging technology where it is today, that's not possible for everybody. But I think um, and even like 10 years down the road, maybe it's not about compostable. Maybe everybody is moving towards reusable. Like that's why it's like it's compostable is what we're focused on right now because it's what we think consumers can easily adopt and not have to change their habits. Um, but our mission is to help transition the industry away from plastic. And um, we think like the more noise we can make, like the louder we can be, the more we can keep people thinking about it. Even if they're not um, doing it today, maybe it's on their roadmap five or 10 years down the road. Um, we think like, I just like imagine like this world where when you, like, if you think about today, you walk into the grocery store and all the aisles, it's all plastic. And imagine like what our world would look like if that's just, if that doesn't exist anymore, or if maybe if um, if maybe if manufacturers have to start taking more responsibility for what the packaging that they're selling is is doing to the environment. So um, I don't know. I my like vision is like impacting policy and like doing. You know, I have like these big goals for what we want to do in terms of making noise and helping the industry shift. But um, it's just gonna. It's a journey, and we're we're kind of just getting started on it. 
I love that. And I guess kind of towards both of those, uh, Laura had a question in terms of what's that appetite for VC funding in the sustainability space? And have you found success there or challenges? Yeah, I, I, so, I, so, so I just went through um, equity crowdfunding. I have had I've been having conversations with the VCs um, along our journey. Um, I would say uh, definitely awareness of the trends for sure and an appetite to be involved in the trends. Um, I think there's two important points. One is there's VCs who are truly focused on impact investing. Um, and that is they really see that you can make a huge profit and make a huge impact. And they believe in both of those. Uh, there's also VCs who are focused on making a profit and who see that consumer trends are moving towards sustainability. And so I think the biggest thing as founders in this space, as brands in this space, um, anyone thinking about this type of raising funds um, is you need to make sure that your any partner is fully aligned with the profit and purpose um, and, and the impact. And that's like, uh, I, I think where I'm, what makes me concerned is having really amazing companies take money from people who see the trends and then like ultimately like you know, there's a uh, tension between like that they're not aligned on like the ultimate vision of the business. Um, and I, that's where I think equity crowdfunding is a really amazing place for early stage companies right now, because you can now raise up to $5 million through equity crowdfunding. So you can basically skip the entire VC stage. Now VC, a lot of VCs are amazing value add investors. So maybe that's not the right thing for you, but if it is the right thing for you, it's an option to think about. And I, that, that was founders didn't have this type of option. Um, you know, it's like 10 years ago, equity crowdfunding is a newer thing. And I think it's giving founders more control of leading these purpose-driven businesses and choosing the partners that they want versus just like taking a check because they feel like they have to. Okay, I have to ask too, what, what would you attribute your success to having this um, great fundraising round? Because um, I know it's hard to get a lot of people interested. Um, is there anything that you did that was really able to drive the momentum up? Honestly, um, the reason we were successful with the crowdfunding campaign was like the network that we have built like unintentionally of just as being like people and <laughs> like for the over the past like 15 years. I mean, like it, if I look at it's interesting because I know it's a lot of effort, but like if I look at I'm, I'm preparing to do some blogs on this. So um, I'll make sure to share them with you, Jordan, once I do this. But I want to if I break out like a pie chart of where our money came from. Um, the majority of it came from our own network and it wasn't just like, you know, it wasn't just one, it was my high school friends, my college friends, my business school classmates, my, um, my first job, my second job, my third job. Um, same with my, like my husband's, my co-founder, same with him. So it was, um, and then lever using that network, like e emailing them, like following up with them. So it was, that was a huge thing that made it successful for us. It's a lot of work. Um, and then of course, like you get um, investments from like the crowdfunding platforms as well. Um, it's a lot of work though, a lot of effort. And Caroline, I know you did equity crowdfunding too. So I don't know if your perspective is the same or different. Yeah, we, we did it um, through a platform called Republic earlier this year as well. It was a great way to turn our consumers into investors and kind of have like a built in like focus group that we can bring new products to or questions or kind of just like brand champions. So, um, but yeah, I, I totally agree that most of them came from our own network. Um, and uh, it was a lot of work <laughs> to get that set up and to, to nurture them. And it was not the easiest process for sure, but a lot of valuable um, learnings that came out of it. And I would just say like to echo Kate's point as well as like finding the right partners um, for, for our VC journey. Like we have just partnered with ICA fund, which is growing good jobs in Oakland um, where we're based. So I think there's a lot of opportunities to find investors who are focused on different parts of sustainability as well. And like to Jordan's point around T squares, like um, growing jobs and like building the community is, is one part of that as well. This has been so amazing. Kate, Carolyn, and you know Pat had to jump off, but all three of you just provide so much insight and 
just judging from the amount of questions in the chat, there's so many people who are so interested in this topic. And I really appreciate that you're able to provide just very direct practical answers so that people walking away from this webinar can like make actionable steps towards improving their business, finding sustainable partners, and helping them decide which direction to go. So genuinely just really thank you for being here and for joining today. Yeah, it was so much fun. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you, Jordan, for putting this together. And um, I'll just drop my email into the chat too. So feel free, anyone to, to reach out. We're always happy to connect. Yeah, I'll, have, I'll drop mine in here too. Excellent. Thank you so much, everyone. We do have a recording of the webinar that I will send out in the next couple of days. And you know, have a great rest of your Friday. Have a great weekend. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to Kate or Carolyn or Pat. Um, their emails in the chat so copy those out before um, we close this down but have a great rest of your friday and we will talk with you soon thank you so much everyone